Good evening and welcome to the Grace Talk. I am Gloria Gadsden. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are continuing with a conversation that we started last month on COVID-19. Our discussion today would focus on COVID-19 prevention and early treatments. My guests today are John Riddell, Chairman of Faith and Freedom Coalition Delaware, and Dr. Jane Orient. Now, John is a uh, familiar face on the gray stock, but Dr. Jane is a first timer. And oh my goodness, what credentials she comes with. I am telling you, uh, Dr. Jane is Executive Director of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. She is President of Doctors for Disaster Preparedness, Managing Editor of the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons. She is an author, and she has so many degrees and accolades that I will not be able to mention here. So we truly are blessed to have her join our conversation today. Dr. Jane, I would ask you to begin uh, and talk to us about COVID-19. How can we protect ourselves from this disease? I think the first thing that you need to do is to make sure that your immune system has what it needs. And that includes vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc. Most people are vitamin D deficient, even if they live in Hawaii. Even golfers in Tucson have been found to be vitamin D deficient. We just don't get enough sunshine. And people with darker skin need more sunshine because the melanin in their skin is protecting them against ultraviolet, which causes some maybe some cancers. But you also absolutely have to have it to make vitamin D for yourself. So you need to, most people need to take supplements, maybe as much as 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. There's a lot of evidence that people who are vitamin D deficient have four times as high a rate of death if they get COVID-19. So that this is something that we, the public health people really should be telling you instead of censoring any mention of, of the need for these things when you put them on, on uh, social media. Zinc is also very important. I, it, a lot of people are, are deficient in that. And what it does is it helps the, um, it helps the, your, cell, your own killer cells to kill off the virus. And you may need something to help the, the zinc get into the cells. And that's where hydroxychloroquine comes in. Or if you can't get that, uh, quercetin, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, which is a plant bioflavonoid that you can buy over the counter. And of course, vitamin C is necessary for fighting off any infection. And it is used up in fighting infections. So a lot of people need, are deficient as soon as they get any kind of stress. And so you do need to to supplement your vitamin C even more if you get sick from any reason and especially from COVID-19. Thank you. So what we're hearing is that the, the normal vitamins that we need for daily functioning, we just need an additional supply of that to bolster our immune system. So we need vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc. Correct. Now, for those who are listening to us, if you can get it from sunshine, which you just told us we really can't get an, you know, enough of that from the sun, how can we access those vitamins? Well, you have to take vitamin D3, which you can buy over the counter at health food stores, maybe the grocery stores, certainly in the pharmacies. And uh, you, you need to take that. Uh, it's a good idea to get your vitamin D blood levels measured in case you have any doubts about this. And you really should have a blood level about 50 to be optimally able to fight against viral diseases. And this is probably why flu season is worse at the, just at, as spring begins because people have get, been getting even less sun exposure during the winter time. That's really good to hear. Um, yeah, and that makes a lot, a lot of sense. Now, can you talk to us about um, the early treatments that are currently out now? Which of the vaccines work? Well, the vaccines are not an early treatment. They are supposed to uh, stimulate your immune system to make antibodies to COVID-19. If you've already got it, um, 
it's too late for you to get a vaccine. It takes at least three weeks after the second dose, probably to get substantial immunity. And if you if you were sick with COVID-19, it could make a huge difference early treatment. If you wait until you're blue and they'll allow you to get admitted to the hospital, then the, the treatment is much less likely to be helpful. And we have been emphasizing drugs that have been around for a long, long time that were approved by the FDA decades ago have been taken by hundreds of millions of people worldwide. It started off with hydroxychloroquine, which has been under attack all over the world, although there are nearly 200 studies, most of which show that it has at least some effectiveness if you use it early and if you take it with zinc and probably with an antibiotic like azithromycin or doxycycline, and that will help keep you from getting in the hospital. There's much more emphasis now on ivermectin. This has been used since 1981, particularly in Africa. It's on the World Health Organization's list of essential drugs. It has been taken by probably a billion people. Many Africans take it once a month to deworm themselves. It has saved millions of lives from some of the horrible parasitic diseases that were causing so much uh, suffering in Africa. It's also used in other underdeveloped countries. It's widely used in veterinary medicine uh, for dogs, for heartworm. It's used in sheep and pig and cattle and horses to protect against all kinds of uh, diseases. And in human beings in this country, it's used for scabies or for head lice. So we have a lot of experience with using this drug and they're accumulating studies of showing that it is effective for prophylaxis, where it's being used widely in South America. It's useful in early and late treatment of the disease. And it, it's been estimated that maybe 10,000 or 11,000 lives could be saved every week, or maybe even every day if, in, if it, looking at worldwide statistics. Thank you, Dr. Orient. I'm hydro, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Did I get that? Ivermectin? You did. That's correct. Okay. Perfect. Right. Now, you mentioned that this, this have been proven. This, this, this have long-standing um, history behind them and um, all over the world. So this is safe to take. Now, the question I have for you is, when you started, you mentioned that these were not, when, by the time you get COVID-19, it's really too late. So should people be taking, what, what is the right time to take these medicines that you're talking about? Well, that can be debated. A lot of people, like there's just a study come out of Argentina where health workers were taking it prophylactically and before they got sick. And 25% of them who were taking, well, you were 25% as likely to get COVID if you were taking this prophylactically than if you weren't. So that uh, one fourth of the people were taking the drug, of one fourth of the number of people who got it for not taking the drug got it if they were taking the drug. You, you can certainly take it after you do get sick for, for people who have frequent exposure like, uh, like health workers or like prisoners, like in one prison in Arizona, half of the inmates were all be positive for COVID-19. And so they're in a very high risk environment and masks and locking them in their cells for 24 hours a day or 23 hours a day is not, it's not gonna stop the spread. They really need to have access to this very safe medicine. Thank Sorry, you. I, can, I can tell you from some firsthand experience, um, thank God for Dr. Orient and her and Carla Dean Graves and all the other doctors who worked on this because um, back in uh, April of last year, they told me about this vitamin regimen. Sure enough, my vitamin D was low. So Pat and my wife, Pat and I started this regimen. Well, we got COVID uh, in uh, October and immediately on the first sign started taking hydroxychloroquine. We had been taking zinc, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D uh, and, and uh, vitamin A. Um, prior to that, to build up the immune system like they asked us to. Um, 
Pat and I went to two hospitals. Uh, we went to Christiana Hospital because our son asked us to, because he heard us. He said, no, no, I want, you need to go to, went to the hospital. Uh, their protocol was, uh, okay, you're breathing now, uh, go home, and when you can't breathe, come back. N no treatment, no therapeutics, nothing. Uh, we went to Chester County Hospital. Uh, I was admitted not because of the COVID, because my doctors wanted me in there because I had I was a heart patient. I had three two heart attacks. I've had uh, five bouts of AFib. I had an arrhythmia off and on, uh, and they're the ones that they warn you. Oh, don't take hydrox if you have, if you had this. I took it, and the, the strange thing is, doctor, I don't know if it's common. My heart was actually in better rhythm <laughs> taking the hydroxy than it was without it. Now. Uh, for the three days I was in the hospital, I got no, zero therapeutic. Zero. So did you smuggle in your own hydroxychloroquine? Well, I took it before I went there. I was already had my oh, five-day regimen before I went in. And, yeah. and I was in for three days, and I said to the doctor, why am I here? All I'm doing is taking up space in a hospital bed. I need to go home. My wife's sick. Uh, and so they discharged me, uh, and I went home. And, and, but Pat and I did have a little bit of problems with our lungs but no problems breathing. This procedure, this building up these, uh, these vitamins in your system to help fight the immune work. Pat and I got through this in flying colors when our son thought for sure, when he heard all the reports of the doctors, he was gonna lose one of us. Well, he didn't. So this does work and thank God for Dr. Jane Oley and then the others, Carla Dean Grace and all those others who are brave enough to tell you the truth about how these things work. Well, the the, the uh, scare tactics of saying, don't take hydroxychloroquine because it's bad for your heart. Mm -hmm. It turns out that extensive studies have shown that it is very safe for the heart. And as you yourself experienced, it may actually be beneficial mm -hmm. to the heart. Rheumatologists prescribe it for people to take for years if they have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. They don't even bother to do an EKG. It can prolong the QT interval, making you susceptible to a certain type of arrhythmia. But in hospitalized patients who do get the hydroxychloroquine, this has not been a problem. There are some arrhythmias that people who are sick in the hospital with COVID, they have them anyway because the virus attacks the heart. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you should just disregard this potential. You should monitor it and be aware of it but it certainly is not a reason to scare everybody to death about taking this lifesaving drug. Thank you, John and Dr. Orient. So John, what you have just told us is firsthand experience that you and Pat, and by the way, for those who are listening, John and Pat are over 70 years, right? Both, uh, yeah, we're up in our early 70s. I'm 75, I'll be 75 this year, so. Uh, 75 with heart patient. My wife was in her 70s with uh, asthma, uh, and we got through this without with zero breathing problems. So you really are the poster child for the endangered population that we hear about uh, with underlying uh, conditions, and yet because you built up your immune system the way that Dr. Jane just told us with these vitamins and zinc and also taking these medicines, uh, you were able to you know, come out relatively unscathed from this uh, COVID-19. Now, my question is for those who are listening, where can they access these medicines, John and Dr. Orient? I mean, do they need to get them from their doctors? And what if the doctor says, we're not giving you a prescription? Or are these medicines over the counter? Unfortunately, they're both prescription drugs here. There are countries in the world where you can get them over the counter. Some of them took them off that status and required a prescription. There's just been this war on early treatment that is just not understandable from an ethical or medical standpoint. You do need a doctor to prescribe it. Many physicians have are just following the NIH guidelines. They, they've been called therapeutic nihilists. They just don't believe in early treatment. They're giving you the thing. You don't get any treatment until you're sick enough to be admitted. Although now they've relented and said that you can get monoclonal antibodies as an outpatient and a lot of facilities are offering those. There are very few studies on these antibodies. They do seem to have an effect. There's far more research about both the safety and the effectiveness of these long used drugs than about these monoclonal antibodies, which of course are extremely expensive. 
So basically, if, for those who are listening in our audience, you really have to kind of request them from your doctor and insist that they make this prescription. That's what I'm hearing. Well, if they don't, then maybe you should look for a doctor who does. And we have a website called c19protocols.com. Uh, and if you, it's, it shows the different protocols that different doctors have developed for this. But at the end, there are resources for doctors who do in their private practices accept these patients or for telehealth services like speakwithanmd.com slash Corsi, C-O-R-S-I, Nation. And they're familiar with the protocol developed, for example, by Dr. Zelenko in New York and also with other, other treatment regimens. That's how Pat and I got this through the telemed out of Florida. Uh, yeah, good. Works very, very effectively. Um, you know, and, and uh, thank God for them. And thank you, Dr. Ryan, for your, your bravery in this whole process, because we understand that one of the doctors who were promoting these things was brought in by the FBI recently and told to stop doing this. Uh, I, 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 we, it, it's criminal to us, to me, uh, why state governments and federal government are prohibiting therapeutics that keep you out of the hospital. But it, yet, it once is, you're in the hospital. Um, I think it's really, really insane. But 44 states have had restrictions of some sort on either the prescription or the dispensing of hydroxychloroquine. Some of them have removed those restrictions. Um, the FDA has made negative statements that these medical boards and pharmacy boards are relying on and refuse to resend them, even though they cannot come up with any studies that, sh that are a basis for refusing it for early outpatient treatment. There are negative studies for using it in hospitalized patients, which should not surprise you because these patients are past the stage of viral replication and into the stage of overactive immune systems and blood clotting and so on, that the hydroxychloroquine will probably not help. Although I have heard more than one story of a dramatic turnaround in a patient who was dying and who got quickly much better when the doctors were finally persuaded to just try some hydroxychloroquine. And Gloria, what I can tell you is for Pat and I, we, we didn't wait. We didn't wait till we were sick uh, because this process takes several weeks for you to get it. So we had it on hand. Uh, so the first cough we had and the first day we thought we were sick before we even were tested, we started with the hydroxychloroquine, the zinc and uh, doxycycline. Uh, antibiotic uh, therapy. Uh, so by the time we were tested uh, and got our results back, we were already six days out. Uh, so we had taken our five-day regimen of hydroxychloroquine. And then we went on um, to, and, and was it a nebulizer and took, what is it? Uh, budesonide. Budesonide. Uh, yes. uh, inhaled budesonide, which is used for people that have breathing problems. And that's, th that combination seemed to protect our lungs and keep us safe. Yeah, we need combinations. We need a sequence of therapies depending on, on how the patient is doing. And foresight like you exercised is very important because it's it's appalling. I mean, now you can get rapid tests um, in many places, but before you had to get an appointment to get a test, then you had to wait five to seven days to get the results of the test. And doctors were, were refusing to do anything without a positive test. And then with a positive test, they were also refusing to do, many were refusing to do anything except tell you to not isolate yourself so you don't pass it along. Thank you. We have several questions from our audience. We're gonna to touch base and then um, come back after we've uh, answered those questions. Uh, Dr. Darryl Jones, hi, uh, Dr. Jones. He says, what is preventable where we currently are with the COVID crisis? If so, what could have been done earlier? What is preventable today? Well, I think the illness is treatable and it's preventable, at least the, the serious consequences are largely preventable by taking the vitamins that your immune system has to have in order to work. I think initially there was a huge panic over over this and people were locked down even though 
the, the virus is probably no more lethal than the Asian flu or the Hong Kong flu were several decades ago, but people were, uh, were forced to stay home. Businesses were destroyed. Um, people did not get out and about. They did not develop immunity to the disease because they were not being exposed to it. So when they do come out of their hiding holes, they will be more susceptible to the illness. The information was censored about the importance of these vitamins and minerals. And there's actually been just a, a worldwide war against the early use of some of these drugs, at, especially in the Western or English speaking world. And if you look at the nation, national statistics, countries like India or, or countries in Latin America that have, or Africa, that have made use of these medications have, have a mortality rate that's much less than ours, maybe one tenth as high as ours per un, for million population, which should be just shocking because these countries are poor. Many of the people live in overcrowded conditions. They don't have the sophisticated hospitals and medical care that we have here. And yet they're doing far better than we are because they are using sensible outpatient early treatment with drugs that they can afford. Thank you, uh, Dr. Orient. Another question from Lewis. Hi, Lewis Feverin. He says, what about the new variant of COVID? Will the vaccine prevent that? That remains to be seen. I mean, the vaccine was not tested against this. And so we really don't know the companies like Pfizer and Moderna think, oh, well, it'll work just fine. But the spike protein is similar enough that the antibodies that your body will make against it will still work. But I think it, it really is too early to say. The beauty of these drugs like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, and of course the vitamins, is that they are nonspecific. They do not depend on the virus having a certain exact configuration, which your is required if the vaccine is going to is going to work they work by changing the the conditions inside your cell where the virus penetrates and replicates itself to to be just very unfavorable changes like the acidity of the cell so it doesn't really matter if the virus has a little bit different uh, genome it still requires certain physical and chemical conditions in order to replicate itself. Thank you. So the beauty and the, and the value of these early treatments is that it really makes your body inhospitable to these you know, viruses. Exactly. Okay. Now, um, another question from Linda. Hi, Linda. Linda Sadowski. Linda says, John, I'd like to know how you were able to get these medicines ahead of time, if you're able to share with us. Certainly, uh, because of doctors like Jane Orient and Carla Dean Graves who, uh, and uh, Jerome Corsi, who we worked with, um, um, these doctors were very interested in the, disease, in the diseases that were happening in the African American community. So they asked us a few years ago to come to Washington, D.C. with a bunch of uh, African-American pastors to talk about the community and what's happening with diseases. And so the, these doctors worked with them and got a lot of intelligence and, and information to start working with them. So we had all these friends that were doctors. And the minute uh, they called us right away and they, because they knew about our history and our age, they said, John, you need to get hydroxychloroquine immediately. So we, we you know, if you go to that site that Dr. Uh, Ar Orient was talking about C-19, uh, protocols.com they can i think they can link you to these tele uh conferencing tele doctoring where you actually call down you talk to a doctor that's going to ask you some basic questions about your heart uh and then he either okays you getting it or not okays you get it the okay you getting it he transfers you right away to a pharmacy uh, and you get your uh supply of hydroxychloroquine and um uh, uh really pharmaceutical grade zinc uh, to help you as soon as you get sick. So um, like I said, it takes about two weeks in this process, uh, but we knew the quality of what we we're getting was good quality stuff. So we had it uh, in our house, ready to go, uh, thanks to this wonderful telemedicine. And, th and these doctors 
and, and Dr. Uh, Jane and, and others out there are really the heroes of this fight against COVID-19. Uh, they stood up when they were, be called, they were being called names, they were being threatened, they were being ridiculed. And really the, the villain in this is the NIH and the CDC and, and the World Health Organization. They purposely withheld information about the knowledge of these things when they knew they would work. Every Vietnam veteran, and I happen to be one, took hydroxychloroquine for a year when we were in Vietnam to fight off malaria. Every single one of us. So they knew that it wasn't dangerous. I called my heart doctor and thank God he was a good one. And he said to me, John, you don't have the long QT in your heart rhythm. You're perfectly safe. It's a cheap alternative. It's a good protocol to prevent. Go ahead and take it. So uh, what we started doing was taking a therapeutic uh, dose of one hydroxy a month, uh, but zinc every day. Uh, we drank uh, tonic water, which has quinine in it. Uh, and the over-the-counter, when uh, Dr. Jane, maybe you could say it again, what it is, th that works, I think, almost effectively as hydroxychloroquine. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Jane's right. The, the virus goes into the cell. The zinc is what does the work to undo it but the zinc can't get into the cell. Hydroxychloroquine opens a channel the zinc rides on that carries it into the cell. So get it, have it on hand and protect yourself. Yeah, the, the compound I mentioned is quercetin, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. There are also other bioflavonoids that do this. There's one present in green tea and I can never remember the name of that, but these are available over the counter. They do not have all of the effects that hydroxychloroquine has. One thing it does, it probably helps prevent your red blood cells from clumping. Um, but if you can't get the hydroxychloroquine, these would probably be of some benefit. Thank you. If you're joining us right now, we have been talking with Dr. Jane Orient. Um, her credentials are too long for, for me to uh, repeat or to mention on this call. Um, and she has told us a couple of things. First is that you need to build up your immune system. The preventative measures are critical to make sure that your body is ready to fight and to overcome the invasion of COVID-19. And what are those treatments? Vitamin C and vitamin D regimen, because you don't ever get enough from your normal sources, uh, whether it's the sun or the food that you eat. So you need to supplement your normal intake with over-the-counter uh, supplements. And also zinc, as John has uh, very well described right now, zinc is kind of opens the uh, channel for the medicines to work. So, and this, the vitamins D, vitamin C and zinc are over-the-counter uh, medicines that we can take, supplements, right, really, that we can take to shore up our immune system to be ready to battle any disease really, but particularly uh, COVID-19. She also mentioned that um, these medicines, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and the one that she just talked about now are extremely helpful in combating these diseases and creating an environment within your body that really battles and rejects and rebels against this disease if it were to try to come in. Now let's go on and talk, touch base with our audience again. And Linda says, I'm very grateful for these doctors who are standing up for truth. Thank you, John. I am going to look into the c19protocol.com to have it in our arsenal, should we need it. Uh, there you go, John, that was very helpful. Now, I also mentioned that we do have a guide to early treatment for patients that you can download free from aapsonline.org. And it mentions these protocols. It also explains the different stages of the disease like the first stage is when the virus is, is reproducing in your cells. The second stage is when you have this overreaction from the immune system. And the third stage is when you get blood clots. And for a long time, we didn't even do autopsies on patients who were dying. When we finally got around to doing autopsies, we found something nobody had suspected, that these people were dying with blood clots. I mean, you, you, it doesn't matter if, if air can get in out of your lungs, if the blood can't get there, because it's blocked by little blood clots. There are also really big blood clots in your pulmonary artery, even remarkably in your aorta. So people are having strokes and heart attacks and just uh, 
a damage to all kinds of organs, including the lungs, because of these clots that we were not recognizing. So finally, we've gotten the idea that, yeah, we really do have to anticoagulate some of these, pe these people. Thank you, Dr. Orient. One more question from Linda. Linda says, is it true that COVID-19 virus has a patent? which means that it is man-made, it is a man-made virus and not naturally occurring. There are some patents and uh, on certain, certain aspects of the virus. Um, and there, there has been this controversy, did it come from this wet market in Wuhan from bats and just jumping species or was it manufacturer had enhancing features in, in the laboratory and either got out of the laboratory by accident or even on purpose. There's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, there, there are competent people on both sides of the controversy. I just really don't know. But what I do know is that people are suffering and dying all over the world. And these measures, these, these very repressive measures that governments are taking are destroying the economy, destroying people's lives, their families, their livelihoods, their churches, their schools and causing suicides and drug abuse and all kinds of problems, but are not, are not doing the job of controlling the contagion. We have to have people having access to preventive and early treatment. I guess, of course, people are having a lot of faith in the vaccines and now they're beginning to be out there, but if you've already got it, it's too late for you. And there are a lot of questions about the vaccines too. Dr. Jane, could you tell us just two things? One, do mask work? And, and two, are the vaccines really safe? One, do the masks work? Well, there is a lot of difference of opinion about that. There are studies one way or another. Uh, the only sort of randomized controlled study, which is the, what is demanded for all of these drugs, showed that the results are compatible with masks increasing infection rates by 23%. They might decrease them by 46%. Notice that's not 100%. May decrease it by 46%, but you can also, the confidence interval is wide enough that could actually be increasing infections. It certainly decreases by at least a little bit your the oxygen that you can breathe in. It may, depending on the mask, it may increase the carbon dioxide that you're breathing into levels that are unacceptable in the workplace, according to OSHA regulations. The masks will grow all kinds of bacteria and fungi, especially if people don't wash them frequently. So the masks are controversial. They, they are certainly not the magic barrier that's going to keep us all from getting sick. Even if everybody wears a mask for 100 days, I mean, I've tried this in, in, in a bunch of marine recruits and the ones that were adhering to all of these social distancing and mass mandates got sick just to work. So may, maybe it helps somewhat. It's certainly part of personal protective equipment if you're exposed to, to patients who are shedding a lot of virus. But putting mandates on the whole population may be of some use but it certainly is, is not 100%. Thank you, Dr. Jane. I was going to ask you that question myself, but what, again, let me try and understand what you're saying. You're saying that the masks may um, prevent up to 40, about 40%, 40 but it could conversely increase the, the infection rate by about 20%. So it really net, nets out um, and the, and the benefit is truly marginal. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think it's truly marginal. Now, if you're using a properly fitted mask and you're using it properly in an environment in the hospital, then it is probably of some protective value to you. But just out in public, it probably is not very much value. And to wear it when you're bicycling outside by yourself is dangerous. Now, people have dropped dead doing this probably cuts down on their oxygen supply just enough and is of no conceivable benefit when you are outside um and i do at have least when you're when you're bicycling and exercising and you're not really in a crowd i do have a friend who is a pharmacist and so they she's required to wear this constantly and she was lightheaded she was really in trouble um wearing this all the time indoors 
and working, uh, you know, uh, full days. Um, she, she was almost about to collapse because of the oxygen, um, sorry, carbon dioxide recycling that she, you know, the intake back and forth because her mask was on the entire day. Yeah, a lot of people, 80% of people report having headaches. Now, there are masks that will um, be less likely to cause that because they really don't work. You're just breathing around the mask or breathing through the mask. So it's kind of a choice. Either the mask is making you sick or it doesn't work. Dr. K, how about the, the, the vaccines? Are they safe? I've heard so many things about how dangerous they are. Well, no vaccine is 100% safe. Uh, there, there's always risk. If you look at the vaccine package inserts, they will list a whole long list of things. The, the immediate threat is anaphylactic shock, where you just can't breathe, your airway clogs up, and you will die if you don't get epinephrine or some other way to treat that. And that seems to be more common with this vaccine than in others. One reason is it has a polyethylene glycol in it, which is present in a lot of foods or medicines and people may get sensitized to it without realizing they're allergic. And then if you inject it, it's a much bigger stimulus than if you're just uh, swallowing it. And so they, they may have this. There have also been, oh, let me see, the vaccine adverse event react reporting system, according to this one thing on Twitter that I have not uh, verified for myself, is that there were 3,100 cases of anaphylactic shock and 5,000 cases of neurologic damage. Mm. Paralysis, facial paralysis, like a Bell's palsy where you, half of your face is paralyzed. And it's estimated that only 10% of all adverse reactions are being reported. I think something that is more worrisome is the long-term effects that we really can't know about because they've only been out there for two or three months are infertility. And in fact, a lot of vaccine package inserts will say that we do not have information about potential impairment of fertility or carcinogenesis or mutagenesis, which would be birth defects. So if you're pregnant, it's a possibility that this could cause a miscarriage. If you're not pregnant, it could prevent you from becoming pregnant. One thing that a former official at Pfizer said was that the spike protein that your body is gonna make antibodies to has some overlap with syncetin, which is required to make a placenta. So you may become allergic to the placenta. Pfizer denies that. It says the overlap is very small. It's not gonna happen. But, you know, they really don't know. I mean, the animal tests have not been done. And there's an additional thing is that the lipid envelope that surrounds and protects the messenger RNA and the viruses, which is what tells your cell to become a, a vaccine factory or to become a factory for foreign viral protein so that, so that your body will become a vaccine factor, that also may have impairment of fertility and the nanoparticles that go along with it may get into your reproductive organs along with your other organs. So there are just unknowns about this. And so I think that if you are a young person, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, you should have some hesitation about taking this vaccine. We have not done any head-to-head -head studies between vaccine and taking hydroxychloroquine or taking ivermectin to see which is more effective at preventing disease. I mean, the manufacturers will admit that they do not know whether it even prevents you from transmitting the disease. So if you get exposed to it, you yourself may not get symptoms, but you may still be able to infect other people. Wow. Um, this definitely it gives me a lot of pause. Um, John, did you have something to say? Uh, no, it, it's, it's, I, I saw a video. Um, someone sent me of Bill Gates, uh, who is funding a lot of these vaccines and the, and the money behind it, uh, where he said about uh, seven years ago, uh, the best way for population control is through vaccination. Uh, so uh, personally, I just don't trust them. And that's not a scientific uh, uh, analysis. That's just like Dr. Jane says, there's no history about it. There's no understanding about it. For instance, uh, look at me. I had, in, in the 1980s when I had a heart problem, I mean, when my cholesterol it was high and still is, they said, oh, stop eating butter and start eating margarine. Oh, and go on a statin. 
Well, I went on the statins and, and I went on the uh, uh, margarine. And it turns out the trans fat in the margarine was 10 times worse than anything in butter. And I ended up clogging three arteries that I had to have three stents put in. Uh, and when I had the statins, my muscles, after four years, five years on the statins, my muscles would start to automatically constrict on their own without any kind of exercise in my stomach. And my arm, when Pat saw it in my arm, she just about panicked uh, how my muscles were just, my tricep would be like this, normally would be like this. Uh, and so they, they, and the same thing with these vaccines. These things have no long range history at all and they shortcut it to testing. Why do you think the manufacturer said, we need immunity from lawsuits if we put this out? If it's that safe, why do you need immunity? So. Well, there is a, what's called the V-Safe program that they're supposed to tell you about when you get your vaccine and you can sign up for that. The, the vaccine adverse event reporting system that we have is so incomplete that maybe 10% of adverse reactions are reported, maybe only 1%. The only study that we had showed only 1% re reported at Harvard Pilgrim, and that was never followed up on. So we really don't know. And then the autoimmune diseases and lo <coughs> long-term neurologic effects, even dementia or other memory problems may be seen because of the adjuvants that are in the vaccine, the aluminum adjuvants that really have never been well tested in people. And almost all of the vaccines, the COVID vaccines are adjuvanted except for the Anovia one that's not available yet. So I, I just think there are a lot of questions. And you know, if you're facing something like smallpox, which is killing at least 30% of the people who get it and is even much more contagious than the COVID-19, then it's one thing for public health reasons to want to get the vaccine. But for something that most people are going to survive, 99.9% .9 of people are going to survive and far more than would survive if only they had access to early treatment. Then, then having this mass vaccination program is something history may look back upon and say, this is just a mass unconsented human experiment that's being motivated by fear of the disease or just by fear that you're not gonna be able to go to work or go to school or travel if you don't comply with these mandates that Bill Gates loves so much. Wow, we really, um, I am again, um, we've heard many of this, but hearing it from you and, and really um, just, it's, it's concerning the level of pressure that is being brought on people, you know, economic pressure, the inability to sustain your business, the inability to go to work with that if you don't comply and that is one of the questions we have, and that probably will be our last question for today. What can we do as citizens if they begin to mandate this vaccine? That is a really good question because, you know, vaccine mandates have been around since 1905. And they're mandated for children. Something like 73 doses of different vaccines are required for children to go to school. And court challenges have, have generally been unsuccessful. Um, we might keep trying, but they're all based on this 1905 precedent that involved the smallpox vaccine. And the fine for not getting it was $5. You know, it was worth a lot more then than now, but still it was a, a fine of $5. And somebody challenged the fine, you know, it's an interference with our civil liberties. Um, plus all these lockdowns are interference with all kinds of civil liberties, our ability to associate, our ability to petition the government, our ability to worship, um, just all of these things are justified by this sense of emergency. And the sense of emergency is being sustained because people are truly afraid. Mm -hmm. I know so many people who are just panic stricken. They're afraid to go out of their house. If they do go out of their house, they feel like they have to uh, disinfect everything that they touch, including the, the grocery bags or the packages of the groceries come in. And they're afraid that if they get sick, they're for sure gonna die. And if they, um, or they'll infect their grandmother or they'll infect, they'll infect somebody and then they'll be murderers with blood on their hands. Whereas it seems to me the people who are interfering with the, with the information going to patients about how to protect themselves or with their ability to get early safe treatment, they're the ones that have blood on their hands. 
Wow, Dr. Jane, what a um, eye-opening conversation we've had today and really thought-provoking. Um, for our audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and Linda says, there's no money in preventative measures, and that's why they're not being encouraged. It's always that like when you follow the money, it's, it tells you what is going on as far as the policies. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to uh, end today. And I would love to have you come back. You are obviously a wealth, uh, a treasure trove of information and people are you know, extremely interested and would like to learn more from you because we need voices of truth. And there's, you know, it's a challenge to know who to trust and who to listen to because there's so much misinformation and there's so much um, you know, um, conflict of interest. People have other agendas that are hidden that is making it so hard for regular people like us to understand what to do. And thank you for your voice of truth and your voice of courage. And people are very thankful. Um, there's a lot of uh, audiences saying, thank you for being on our show today. And I hope that you come back and help us as we navigate this maze of vaccines and whatever else mandates comes down the pike. Thank you well, for joining us today. Thank you, Gloria. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Gloria, I, I can say one thing. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that Pat and I did have, uh, and it's the same thing if you had a common flu, uh, was fatigue, real bad fatigue. Uh, all right, so we're 74 years old. We you know, have, have comorbidities and we're alone in the house. No one's allowed to come in. Uh, and when I was in the hospital, I, I knew I had to rush the back to be at Pat's side. Uh, and they said, well, we're not going to discharge you. I said, well, I don't care if you do or not. I'm getting up and walking out tomorrow morning. <laughs> The, the, the thing, what I'm trying to say is Pat and I did not eat. We would lost 14 pounds. Uh, and if not for our friends, if not for the contact for people coming in and saying, hey, you notice you're looking really gaunt and you're not eating. You know, so for us, we went out and ordered a cheesy hamburger, that greasy hamburger they delivered and that got us eating again. But what I'm saying is the churches, <clears throat> pastors, uh, if you have people that have COVID that are senior and alone, you need to check on them. You need to call them. You need to be in contact. We had so much food dropped off at our house when people found out that we needed food because we weren't eating or had the strength to cook that we could have opened a food bank. That's what we have to do. That's something that churches and pastors can do right now. Check on those that are alone. Absolutely. Be one another. There's be our brother's keeper, keep an eye on those who are sick and those who need help, particularly those who are, who are shut ins or who live alone. Thank you, John, for that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we hope to uh, join us again next week for another um, edition of The Grace Talk. Good night, and may the Lord God bless you. Good night.